Good morning, everyone, uh, or afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, my name is Pedro Barada. I am the Executive Director of the Future Skills Center at Ryerson University. I'm very excited to welcome you to the first of the Trailblazer series. Uh, these webinars are hosted through the Future Skills Center with Ryerson University and Magnet today. And our inaugural guests to help, to help kick off uh, this webinar series are, appropriately, people who spend night and day uh, thinking about how we build things. So welcome to our partners at the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum and thank you so much for joining us on this new venture. Uh, we're starting today with a land acknowledgement. Um, I am in Toronto, I will reflect the land on which I am standing uh, and I know that you will receive it as a reflection of our relationship with Indigenous peoples across Canada. Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. The treaty bound them together to share the territory and protect the land. And subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers, have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. For those joining the Future Skills Center for the first time, I say hello. I hope that this is the beginning of a long and fruitful relationship. And I also want to invite you to join our community of practice. We launched the community of practice this summer. Uh, we intend for it to be a powerful peer-to-peer -peer learning and networking tool for those working and researching in the skills development ecosystem. When you sign up and join us in the community of practice, and we will share a link in the chat momentarily, and I, I, I really hope that you will have a chance to check it out and to sign up, because with it, you will be part of a unique platform that gives you access to both research databases and a repository on research and skills development, emerging and new research products, toolkits related to skills training, and also opportunities to share experiences and insights through discussion tools. So after today, we will continue the discussion that will be seated by our great panelists in the community of practice, and we will have a dedicated apprenticeship groups. It's a great opportunity to continue the conversation. Um, so we encourage you to join our community, make a profile, share your thoughts on the forum, signing up is free, and we welcome all the expertise that you bring. So help us build it together. This is a relatively new thing. We just launched it in the summer, and we anticipate that it will grow by virtue of all of us participating and being a part of it. I'd also like to say a word about this series of programming, the Trailblazer series. It puts a spotlight on the research and insights that are coming up through innovation pilot projects being supported through the Future Skills Center. We currently have about 50 of these innovation pilots involving many different partners all over the country. Um, in, uh, in most sectors of the economy, uh, targeting a variety of populations and a variety of areas within skills development. Uh, soon we will have this cohort of partners grow as we announce the results of our shock proofing call, uh, which is likely to happen uh, very early on in January in 2020. Uh, so this series really is a way of sharing those learnings with all of you and seed further discussions on our community of practice. Uh, before we jump right in and I get out of the way, I want to congratulate the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum, our partners today, as they celebrate 20 years of bringing together members of Canada's apprenticeship community. This is a community of individuals who are passionate about their work and the commitment they bring to Canada's economy. So congratulations, 20 years and more ahead of us, no doubt. All right, on to today's program. I am very much looking forward to hearing from our partners at the Apprenticeship Forum and the deep innovative work they are rolling out with this new skills assessment tool called the Valid 8. The tool, the Valid 8, was first developed in the UK with wide application in skills development and is now being adapted for use here in Canada. Following that presentation, we'll dive into a panel discussion on the state of training programs in the skilled trades. In a moment, I will introduce the participants on the panel. After all of that, at the end, we'll open it up to your questions with a Q&A. And of course, after that, you will sign up to be part of our community of practice. Uh, so it's, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our co-chairs for today, Emily Aerosmith and Michael Barnett. Emily is the project manager and researcher at the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum, and Michael is current chair of the Canadian Council of Directors of Apprenticeship and Director of Apprenticeship and Occupational Certification with the Government of New Brunswick. Following their presentation, we will be joined for a panel discussion with Daniel Casey, Director of Training for LARMEX. Uh, 
Hello, Daniel. Bev Young, Training Director, National Construction Council with the United, the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners. Say hi, Bev. And Robert Smart, Creator of Validate, originally from the United Kingdom, but these days, he tells us, residing in Ottawa. Michael, over to you. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Thanks very, very much, Pedro, and uh, welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, as Pedro mentioned, I'm the current uh, Director of Apprenticeship for the province of New Brunswick, and here today representing the Canadian Council of Directors of Apprenticeship as well. I uh, wanted to give a brief introduction about apprenticeship in Canada. I'm, I'm assuming that most people on the call will have a bit of an understanding of skills, skills trades training in this, uh, in this country, but I did want to talk just to give people a little bit of context around how trades training happens before we get into sort of the rest of the presentation today. As most of you are aware, 80% of apprenticeship skilled trades training is done on the job with 20% done in um, classroom training. And, uh, you know, it's the responsibility of provinces and territories to facilitate the delivery of this training at public, private and union training institutions. As a Canadian Council of Directors of Apprenticeship, it's our responsibility for the care and maintenance of the Red Seal program, which is one of the original mobility agreements for Canada, allowing the skilled trades to have a nationally recognized training standard and exam. The CCDA has been furthering this collaborative work within the 54 Red Seal trades to substantively align four common elements, trade name, number of hours required, training levels, and sequencing within those training levels. All of those are in various stages of completion. With training standards and curriculums being addressed, it makes sense for us to turn our attention to other needed areas in apprenticeship. Paper-based logbooks and written multiple choice exams are two of those areas that require some work over the next, uh, the next little while here. So in a minute, Emily's gonna get into more details around the concerns for these topics, but I wanted to give a sense of how they work currently. For logbooks, there's an assessment process in jurisdictions that requires apprentices to prove capability in their trade. In all jurisdictions, it includes a certain number of hours. And in some jurisdictions, it also includes a paper-based logbook where an apprentice is required to have proof of scope coverage signed off by an employer or journey person. On the exam side, the final test is written multiple choice that must be passed with a mark of 70% or better in order to achieve Red Seal status. We can all understand that tactile learners who enjoy working with their hands can often struggle with this type of an assessment. This is why CCDA is eagerly awaiting the results of this research project in the Validate tool. Um, just before I turn it over to Emily here, there was one uh, poll question that we wanted to do for the group. So maybe if I can ask Magnet to throw that poll question up there and get everybody to give us a sense of where everybody's coming from today. All right, maybe while people are filling out the poll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Emily now to, to talk and we'll, we'll see the results of the poll in a little bit. Great, thanks, Michael. So um, really happy to be here today. I'm gonna uh, give Robert an opportunity to give you a bit of um, overview of the Validate tool so you can um, have a chance and see what we're talking about. But just before I pass it over to Robert, I did wanna, share some of the apprentice perspective with you. So at the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum, we do a lot of surveys and research with uh, apprentices to find out about their experiences um, on the job and at technical training to give them a more of a voice in what we're doing. Oh, there we go, Michael. Do you want to share the results? I think they're, uh, I'm, I'm hoping they're up on screen for everybody to see, but basically, uh, a variety of different backgrounds joining the call today. Um, people from everywhere from policymakers to researchers, uh, trades instructors, and employers on the call. So great to see that kind of, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, diverse group of, of individuals on the call today. So thank you. Back to yeah. you. Emily. Yeah, great, great. Yeah. So I wanted to share some of the concerns or challenges that apprentices across this experience, uh, across the country, in multiple trades uh, experience on the job. And it re really relates to two things, the paper-based nature of the log books, apprentice learning and inclusion. So just in terms of the paper-based aspect of the log books, when you survey and talk to apprentices um, in interviews or focus groups, or once again, you know, national surveys that we do, they tend to have a struggle sometimes with the paper-based log books because they get lost 
and then they can't, if they get laid off and they have to find a new employer, they struggle to articulate what they have achieved already and what they can do. Um, in terms of apprentice learning, apprentices tell us that they really thrive best and do their best work when they can be in an experiential, practical training environment. They like to demonstrate and show what they can do. And actually one of the number one factors that attracts apprentices to an employer is high quality training, teaching and mentoring. Um, so some apprentices feel, or they tell us, that they do not feel sometimes that the logbooks provide that dynamic learning experience of teaching, mentoring, and high quality that they really want, especially in some cases if the employer does not integrate it into the day-to-day -day training, and they don't have consistent conversations with the apprentice about the logbook. So some apprentices tell us, I, you know, I had no idea where I was at in the training. No one talked to me about it. I got discouraged and I ended up dropping out of my program. And although we know the rates are very significantly by trade, overall studies have shown from Stats Can that there is a 50% um, completion rate um, in apprenticeship. And, and finally, uh, uh, in the research, uh, issues related to inclusion also arise. For persons with disabilities in particular, um, some of them say that the multiple choice test really poses some learning barriers for them. Um, they do have the ability to do the work, but sometimes the test anxiety or, or um, weakness in terms of document use makes them struggle with the format of the multiple choice test. So given all of this feedback direct from apprentices, the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum really wanted to explore what other things could we do to try to help support apprentice learning on the job. Let's do some experiments. Let's try some things out. It's okay if they don't work, but like, let's just try some new things. So in the U United Kingdom, Robert Smart uh, from the metric has uh, developed the Valid 8 tool. And this tool allows apprentices to document their training on the job through videos, pictures, and text. The online tool has been formally evaluated and it has been shown to help apprentices in the UK progress in their programs and improve on the job safety. So CAF, through the amazing opportunity offered by the Future Skills Centre, wanted to pilot and try out this validate tool with Canadian apprentices in four trades, electrical, carpentry, welding, and plumbing. And we wanted to see if the tool does help apprentices progress and what Canadian apprentices really like about the tool and what they don't like about the tool. Um, and that this uh, pilot through the Future Skills Centre has given us an opportunity to put the Canadian Red Seal standards in the tool and to give a free opportunity for Canadian apprentices to try it out. So at this point, I'd like to pass it over to Robert Smart so he can give you an overview and some highlights of the Validate tool. Robert? A very good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, as, um, thanks very much, Emily, for the introduction. And uh, Pedro, yes, I am in Ottawa, so despite my accent, I am here. Um, so the Validate system, its original forerunner was developed over 20 years ago um, when I was head assessor very far for BMW. And what we were facing was similar challenges to what everybody has been talking about this morning. And that, that multiple choice exams, written exams, documentation created more of a barrier to apprentices in a very much a vocational study and program than some more academic courses. So we felt that we needed to overcome what was known as the spacing effect, which was the, the time taken between when someone was to learn something and didn't apply it and then had to try and recall it, to the fact that it's a biological fact that we, if we apply the learning we've learned, we're much better at that process. So what you'll see now is the Validate tool basically takes that process and allows the apprentice to present evidence in a manner that suits their individual style assessment capability and opportunity to capture evidence. Hopefully now you should be able to see a log on page. 
In this brief example, I will log on as the apprentice and it's completely mobile um, compliant. It's just obviously for this example, I'm showing it on a desktop. I am logging in as the apprentice. The very first thing that I am seeing is my dashboard. And again, I've zoomed in deliberately for clarity. We can see exactly how far through they are in relation to the Red Seal standards and the other modules or standards that have been uploaded. We can have copies and things of certificates and qualifications and so on and so forth that the individual may have uploaded. They can have a video introduction of themselves. It gives them milestone recognition, tells them the type of assessment methods that are being used, and then an overall completion and accepted and marked as insufficient rate for all of the modules that they may be undertaking. The main example I'm gonna focus on, which is video in this case from a mobile phone. I mean, as Emily has said, we can use stills, audio, written testimony, any other forms of evidence, but certainly the most powerful is video. Now you might not be able to use video in the workplace per se, sometimes due to constraints within the environment you're in, but certainly it's a good way to convey knowledge, understanding, behaviors, communication, and language. Now I've defaulted the module so that they, they are showing as all, so therefore they do look quite long on the page, but they, traditionally it doesn't look that way. But for this example, I wanted to give you some insight about how this particular page can work. The G denotes that there is learning content or in uh, video or audio that's been provided as a support to the individual. The A, which is an automatic cross-referencing capability, means if someone loads some prior learning or assessment recognition that you know will meet certain criteria, in this case, you can see the criteria listed underneath that the evidence would automatically cross-reference to. But this is an important recognition that while each indi in individual province have their own standards, you can within a tool upload your own provincial standards and then link them automatically to the Red Seal if desired. Doesn't mean you have to work with the Red Seal standards as you can see in this example. So as I go down this particular long module, the very next module I get to is task A1 from the electrical Red Seal. And we can see that in this case, that David has met some of the criteria by uploading some forms of evidence. Now in this case, he's uploaded some electrical work. So if I click view and go in and see the video that's been uploaded from the mobile phone, it was submitted by David on this date and signed off by me at this date. But more importantly, he suggested and tagged the video that at 17 seconds, he demonstrates the safe working practices. And by clicking it, uh, it will jump straight to the relevant bit within the video. So therefore, making it very quick and efficient for the assessor and the journey person or the apprentice to tag areas within the footage that are relevant to the competences. So having that, time, that patented time indexing within the tool to allow the apprentice to do exactly what I'm about to do now, which is call up the footage from the mobile phone, and I will bring the volume down so it doesn't talk all over me. As it's playing, they would simply on their phone say, well, it covers this one, this one, this one, and this one, and this one. And as I said, through this unique patented technology, we can even fast forward it. We can go in, we can say electrical motors, control panels. And because we're covering skills, knowledge, understanding, behavior, safety, risk, and communication, we're covering all of the elements, overcoming dyslexia, dyscalculi, race or gender inequality. When they finish, they click the save time reference links. And of course, that's when they can put in a comment or again, just talk if they have dyslexia, put in an explanation. The technology will confirm where the evidence has now been linked. And as mentioned before, if we then go down to review the footage at any time, there is a clear, unimplied proof of the learner stroke apprentice's capability that was tagged at this particular time at 37 seconds. Now that gives you an idea of the kind of capability of where they can upload video, they can upload documents, they can highlight passages, it works in the same way. They can attach files, they can even pull in from the dashboard, past credentials, site cards, sample health and safety course on this example. They can bring it through and attach it. This creates a very enriched, what I would call blended assessment environment that allows now the apprentice to track and record their progression through their apprenticeship. Now, very briefly, just to show you how the assessor would then take, or the journey person would then take on the role of countersigning or marking the work, because at the moment, um, it's only what the apprentices upload. I mean, the journey person or supervisor can do it in the first instance if necessary, 
with this example I showed you as the apprentice. I can now see all of my apprentices, how far through they are, how many development plans are open, who the nominated journey person is, if I'm doing it in conjunction with someone else. And the verified role here is sampling the decisions that potentially the journey people are making if you so wished to record the fairness of assessment model. That's just one of the capabilities that exist. Now, as I know who the apprentice is in this case, I will zoom straight to David's portfolio. And of course, this is completely pandemic COVID proof because the evidence comes to me. I don't have to go into the apprentice to sample the work. And I can now mark, grade, and give feedback and also see any assessor guidance that's been given to me to help me make my decisions. So I can then mark it. In this case, I'll just say mark as accepted. Well done. Save the conclusion. That then has been marked as, as, as accepted. But of course, if I need to countersign all of the work that's been submitted in one go, I can do that too. I have the tools. But the other element I just wanted to show you very briefly is if I go back on as the apprentice, we can still do multiple choice questions as part of the reinforcement of the learning within the tool if required. I think this is a new paradigm shift in the way that exams potentially were conceived and it should not have been the, necessarily the, the, the role of the exam to determine what they can do and what they can't do if the learning process and the capturing of the evidence in this particular manner reinforces and consistently shows the applied nature, many countries around the world now have dropped the exam requirements because the knowledge is being demonstrated within the performance evidence and therefore overcomes many of the associated barriers. So on that point, I will stop my screen share and I will pass it back to the um, panel and thank you very much for your time. That's great. Thanks, Robert. Now I'd like to pass it back to uh, Michael and he can engage. We can hear industry's voice. So we have uh, Dan Casey from Larmax and Bev Young um, from the Carpenters Union to share their thoughts and give more of an industry perspective because we've heard the apprentice perspective. Before. Mm, sure. Thanks for that, Emily. And, and, and Robert, thanks for the, the presentation there on the tool. Um, as Emily mentioned at this time, we'd like to get an opportunity to get some feedback from industry. So maybe I'll start, Bev, with you and maybe just to, to discuss sort of current challenges um, with the apprenticeship assessment, maybe some of the pros and cons you see of the current approach that we have and some practices that, in your experience, might work well for us as we move into the future. Sure. Thanks, Michael. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Afternoon where I'm at anyway. Um, so, you know, in terms of some of the challenges, the first one is a bit of a broader challenge, and that is that the carpentry trade, where I come from, it's not a compulsory trade. So there are some challenges in engaging apprentices and employers in active participation. The completion of the Red Seal is a voluntary uh, completion, and it can be difficult to make it a priority, especially if there are barriers there that hinder the apprentices from wanting or being able to complete. So, you know, putting more tools into the apprentice's hands to drive them to completion, the stronger their chances are of succession or succeeding into that um, Red Seal endorsement. And also putting that same tool into the hands of our employers. And that's where I think the Validate tool has so much potential to help progress the way we look at assessing apprenticeship on the job. Um, we have a lot of strong um, relationships with our UBC contractors, with our various provincial authorities and apprenticeship, but documenting remains a challenge. Um, assigning an apprentice to a journey person is, of course, that expectation on a job site, but the reality is, is apprentices are doing work that may not necessarily always be under that watchful eye of their mentor assigned to them. It may be under the direction of someone else. So in a, a tool like Validate, <clears throat> when they can demonstrate that through video and their assessor, their validator can see that maybe after the fact, it's still proof of concept. Um, we also you know, know that there's a limiting factor in slowing production on the job site. Um, and so even if it is the, uh, the journey person who is doing the assessment, there may not be that opportunity for that transfer of knowledge and that really deep discourse and mentorship that is so critical to apprenticeship. So they may be getting signed off on skills with little to no feedback on their procedures and on their safety and 
things that they could have done better. Um, so that's a, definitely a challenge. Um, you know, and just that paper logbook, flipping through it, um, it's big, it's, it's, a, it's a book, it's not a toolbox friendly tool, it's apt to stains and tears, it's rolled up, it doesn't slide in your back pocket the way a cell phone might. Um, again, you know, we're leading to potentially missed opportunities and also determining what is the missing skill set when they're going through, they um, have to flip through that book and they have to take the time to look and see what hasn't been signed off on. Oh, gee, I missed this whole page. They got stuck together because that was my lunch <laughs> that stuck them together. So lots of challenges with that. And then when we speak to the exam process itself, um, the culmination of all of their technical training comes down to a paper-based multiple choice system. Um, and is this truly an examination of their knowledge skill or how well did they study? So I have a, a, an education background and I fully support an examination process. It compels me to see the good in that. But I also feel that when we speak to a Red Seal trade, um, the idea that it's awarded to anybody who scores on a multiple choice test 70% or higher, uh, regardless of their skill that has maybe been demonstrated, it's potentially problematic. So um, an assessment tool like the Validate, I am so excited about this tool coming in, in this pilot. We have really signed up to embrace this. We're, we're sharing this with our contractors. Um, I think it's a driver of change for maybe an antiquated process that's in place. In terms of what's working, I think there are still some things that do work. Strong apprenticeship liaison officers with the various provincial apprenticeship authorities, that's key. That relationship has to be there to help the apprentices track their apprenticeship in their province. Um, engaged employers, that is um, without a doubt, the employers are a big part of apprenticeship. And of course, union involvement. Um, I feel very strongly that the union has a place in apprenticeship. Um, our training centers are there to help support our apprentices with missing skill gaps. Our training funds are there to help apprentices with the training costs and then bring in tools like Validate. And it seems to me you have a, a full slate of supports there for apprenticeship and for completion. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks for that, Bev. And, and I'm sure as we get uh, discussing, there are probably some more questions that come up that we'll throw, throw back out to the panel. I do just want to mention that I see some questions and, and comments coming through in the chat. Um, we're keeping track of all that. I see a couple of them getting answered as we're, as we're going, but uh, we will have opportunity to answer those questions after and, and throw questions to the panel as well uh, as we get going in here. Um, I will maybe get uh, the organizers to throw up one polling question just before we get going with Dan so that we can get the panelists to respond to this one as well. Um, and I wanted to ask the question about the current assessment model for skilled trades and, and if the uh, the participants today feel that um, we can we could adapt to a uh, to a new way of, of doing an assessment. So maybe we can throw that poll up there, and at the same time, then I'll, I'll throw it over to Dan. And Dan, maybe if you want to give us your uh, your understanding of the questions that were asked. And maybe not not so much the poll, but just the actual. Um, uh, where you think our pros and cons are of the current process, what are the challenges you see in the current process and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, uh, thanks everybody. Uh, uh, hi, good morning, good afternoon, depending upon where you are. Um, I guess I'll uh, take off. Uh, I'm going to talk, uh, give you some feedback from uh, three ways of looking at it. So I was an apprentice. I did two apprenticeships. Uh, one is an automotive technician. The other one is a, as a welder. Um, in the province of Quebec for automotive technician, we didn't have uh, the, the, the booklet. So we basically did all this training up front in Quebec. They do everything, all the schooling uh, up front. Then you're left to do your three years and then you just take this exam uh, at the end, a uh, multiple choice. And uh, can that be improved uh, 100%? You know, uh, it, it, if you worked at a dealership, let's say at a Toyota dealership, you know, you would actually, you would have done a lot of the stuff in there. A lot of the times they just get them to do oil changes and, and things like that. So you, it, the, the tool, uh, if they had, if they had just have, had a booklet of all the skills that they needed to do and to demonstrate that they could, they could actually follow, 
uh, that would be much more effective. And I'll, and I'll give you uh, what happened in my case. And I was lucky I took the advice of my, uh, my mentor at the time. Uh, who said go to a small corner garage because you're going to be able to get to see everything and do all aspects and and uh, proof was in the pudding when we started to review for the exam we got together as a group the five out of out of 22 students only uh five of us remained as uh, automotive technicians that had completed the hours to write the exam and uh i was me and another guy that were in those garages that had touched on everything were ready for the exam uh the other guys they they were gonna, they, it had been so long since they seen it. They were working in, 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 a, in, a, in a dealership where they weren't faced with those challenges. And so they struggled. Uh, and it's not to say that they're not, not able to do their job, but to answer, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to take that test and have that be the validation of how good they are is in, in not, not really effective. So uh, that, that was for my uh, te automotive technician uh, journey. Um, when I got into welding, um, uh, I signed up through uh, UA Local 527 in Kitchener Waterloo uh, as a weld apprentice. And uh, again, you know, you, your first day, you're being introduced to a whole bunch of things, and they give you this book. They don't really even go through the book. So uh, I think, uh, I forget when it was, but uh, I remember in a panic running around to people and just getting them to sign stuff. Just, can you sign this, please? Because I need this in order to pass, um, and it, it's it, it it it's completely useless at that point. At, at what I call pencil whipping, you're just pencil whipping. You know, it's there's no there's no real meaning to, you know, that book. Like it's literally useless. Um, but as an as an apprentice, you know, and, and being introduced to the validate tool, you know, when I saw it, my I just my eyes wide open. Like, oh my god, here's a tool that can engage me if I. It can remind me to be like, hey, I'm over here, here on, on this app that you downloaded and you need to be doing this. Have you done this yet? You know, how many hours, you know, can I, can you input, where am I at? I can, I can communicate without having to, to reach out to people. You know, I'm really in charge of my own apprenticeship and that's empowering. And, and, and a lot of people, and, and also I can, I can then, if I did, and I've, I never had the, uh, that from a non-union perspective, because uh, my apprenticeship, uh, as an automotive technician was non-union and I could only, and I've heard challenges from people that work non-union as an apprentice. It, that is, you know, at least with the unions, you have somebody that is guiding them and from one employer to the next, there's that consistency there. And in, and the, the employers can be reassured that the unions are, are looking after that. Non-union from one employer to the next, if you, you know, you come to them with this book and they don't, they don't know, they, 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 don't, they don't know what the past employer was like. So uh, here all of a sudden you have a marketing tool for yourself. You know, you can really show like, hey, this is stuff that I've really done. And here you can see all the videos. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not pulling your chain here when I said I actually did that. Uh, and, and so for the employer, it, it, it kind of gives them the comfort in knowing that, hey, I can take this person on and this is exactly what I can expect from them, as opposed to just, a, you know, a book that who knows how it was signed off. Um, so that's kind of my take on, on uh, the, the apprentice uh, side of things. Um, so in my current role uh, as a director of training, um, you know, we, we are a unionized contractor, but we also do employ a non-union trade. So we're signatory to the UA uh, sheet metal workers and the HVAC, uh, but we also do electrical work. And so we have electrical apprentices that are not, we're not signatory to the IBEW. Um, so from a union perspective, working with unions, uh, here in Ottawa, I work with uh, Local 71 and, and, and I, always have the best intentions of wanting to reach out to them, know where our apprentices are, what can we do as an employer to, you know, help them get through all the things that they need to learn in that short period of time, because the trades are, it's huge. Like for, for welding personally, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff there that you have to cover. And, and um, you know, it, it's easy to get stuck. Like if you're stuck at Acon's fab shop, like a lot of my uh, fellow welders were, you know, you're just, you're dealing with one scenario. You're dealing with a rotator and, and, and uh, just, you know, one or two processes. And if you're there your entire apprenticeship, uh, you know, you, you, you won't be able to complete, you know, what, what's required and gain all the knowledge to really sell yourself as a, 
uh, as a red seal welder because you're going to go to your next employer that's going to throw you out in the field and now all of a sudden you're kind of lost this is a new environment for you whereas if the if the tool could kind of start raising the questions like hey you need to get all this done in order to complete your apprenticeship well it's like okay well maybe maybe i need to leave this employer maybe, maybe i need to go somewhere else uh, but for for us working with the with the unions uh, it, it would really help me to all of a sudden let me know like hey these apprentices they need to do this and i and i know where the jobs are where they can get that stuff done uh so it, it would help me a lot um and same in just dealing with our with our non-union apprentices you know uh, my days busy as it is everybody's uh, busy super busy and and having something that will drive me dashboard where I can see everything instead of having to go schedule meetings, phone calls, like it's, it's, it is hours and hours of, of, it's not wasted time, but if we can, if we can find a better way to do it, um, that, then it make it makes, it makes, it makes us, you know, I can actually focus on, on their apprenticeship instead of trying to figure out where they're at, where they need to go. Right. And so then my time is, is better suited to actually, helping that individual out instead of just trying to assess where they are. Um, uh, another actually aspect that I'll touch on the, uh, you know, uh, on, on using, a, uh, using the exam to, uh, to, to a multiple co a choice question, like the red seal exam, when I wrote it, uh, my personal feeling of it, and I wrote a letter to them, uh, you know, kind of, uh, cause I wasn't pleased with, um, how 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 like the, the the test isn't a true uh it doesn't prove anything really it proves some some knowledge but there was a lot of guys in the room that were very capable welders that struggled they had to take the exam three four times i was lucky that i'd i'd seen that material before i was very well versed in it i, I did take a, a 14 month welding fitting course in montreal before taking my apprenticeship um so you know i felt bad for the guys uh, in that room that just couldn't progress because they didn't have a tool that could just say no listen i i know my stuff i know what to do you know um so it, this tool again just just helps you know uh make make it feel make it feel good make it you know not not having not being held up by what some would call you know a, a flawed system let's say um, I had other words, but you know, try to stay professional. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of my, my that's kind of my two cents. Uh, my two cents about it. This, uh, you know, a tool like this is is so powerful. And I mean, with the challenges that we have coming with, with uh, you know, a retire a, a workforce that's retiring. I think it's about two hundred forty thousand by twenty twenty four will be retiring, and we need to replenish that. If if we can you know, getting people in is easy, but retaining them is the hard part. And, and, and this tool will really help that. And also it should create a better trades, well-rounded trades person by the end of it, because they, they really then, uh, you know, can show that they've actually done it. And then, you know, they, it puts more behind that, that, that ticket. So that's, that's kind of my, my piece. I know that's a lot, but thank, thank you for your time and thanks for listening. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Dan and Bev. Um, and, and I guess I'll, I'll expand on a couple of things and we'll talk about the, uh, the poll results uh, that are there, which of course we can see there's uh, uh, the majority of people saying we haven't changed it in a long time uh, and you're not wrong. Uh, you know, apprenticeship, Red Seal's been around for 60 years, 60 some odd years. Apprenticeship in New Brunswick's been around for, you know, 70 some odd years. It's, it's actually one of the oldest uh, methods of training and instruction in the world uh, going through apprenticeship and skilled trades. Um, from an apprenticeship authority perspective, which, which I represent here in the province of New Brunswick, um, a couple of things that you touched on really, really hit home for us. You know, Bev, you talked about engagement of employers uh, and how important that is. And I think potentially both uh, the current methodology and potential future methodology help to help to engage employers. But, you know, anytime we can move to more of an electronic online type of a, an assessment to make things easier for employers and ease of use is going to be huge uh, in that regard. Um, so I think there's, there's good opportunity there and, and, and there's really good opportunity with the uh, model that's being discussed today. Um, Dan, on your side, when you talked about empowerment and having an apprentice take ownership of, uh, of their training, I mean, that, that's huge as well, right? Uh, we do a lot of work in New Brunswick with 
people who have either learning disabilities or learning gaps trying to get through the trades. Um, we know that our current system of training, not only the, the technical classroom training piece of apprenticeship training, but also our education system in the K-12 system is not necessarily geared towards people, again, who are tactile learners, like to work with their hands and that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, I was talking to my strategic nurses manager here the other day, we were, we were talking about the, the assessment and the actual written test and what we do in that regard and how uh, for people who potentially have alternative ways of learning, um, forcing them to write a written test is bad uh, and making that test multiple choice is even worse, right? Um, so there's definitely, there's work that we can do in this regard and I think we've recognized that. There are concerns with getting there when we talk about ideally an apprenticeship, it would be great if you could do a practical assessment for everything because uh, that's how people are doing the work. And hopefully using this tool will get us moving in that direction um, to, to helping us get there. There's also the, the, the aspects, speaking again from an apprenticeship authority that's responsible for monitoring and doing the assessment to, to maintain the integrity and the quality of people who are getting certification is that imparting that integrity with employers and the people who are signing off on the logbooks. We've all heard out there that somebody, you know, I, I got to go to class. I need my progress record book signed off. So I take it to my journey person and, and that journey person looks at it and he or she says, yeah, okay, I've seen you do that. I've seen you do that. Yeah, you can probably do that and just checks up on all the rest of it, right? I mean, we, we've heard of those examples that are out there. So I, I think, again, this is an opportunity to give people empowerment, um, to have them take true control of their own apprenticeship and then they show through proof uh, of what they're able to do. So, so I think... I think at this point, I mean, I think we're ready to take questions from the audience that's out there. Um, so I, I, if people want to, I think there's a few that have come through the chat. Maybe Emily, you have, you have some of those and we can go over those and invite everybody else. If you have questions, just maybe put them through the, uh, through the Q and A. Um, so Robert, could you clarify for the group, what kind of learning analytics can you track? I know as a part of the pilot, we do want to do some tracking with the uh, learners. And so what can you track as a part of Validate? So first and foremost, I mean, Validate is a competency or mastery based outcome tool. So really the learning is all about measuring the applied learning. So I think when it talks about the learning rubrics per se in relation to tracking them, I mean, the demonstration of the applied learning gives you the assurance that that learning has been reinforced and, and been taken on board. Now, a lot of the paradigms are shifting in relation to what we mean by actually the learning that needs to be undertaken by an individual. I mean, there's some of the other questions on there about the micro credentials, the digital badges, about the fragmentation of bits and pieces. A carpenter who just wants to become a roofer, doesn't want to do the whole thing. I mean, there are lots and lots of things in the mix to, they're going to change the very nature of how we deliver learning, get people into the workplace. Um, and I've seen occasions around the world where they would have something like a foundation apprenticeship, then they'd have an advanced apprenticeship, then they'd have a degree apprenticeship. And it's ways and means of trying to adapt the current process to suit the individual workforce that are going into some of these gaps. Um, um, I mean, I'm not best answer to, the, to answer the learning analytical one. I mean, Scott Murray, who is our vice president of analytics, would be a better person for that, but can happily take that question away and answer that at a later date if necessary without getting I, into the, to the yeah, work. Yeah, I think thing. you can track the time, though, so you can know whether people were engaged oh, in the tool or not. Yeah. yeah, so we can see, okay, they've spent quite a bit of hours on the tool and looking at the requirements and They've, they've tried to upload some stuff and um, Robert, you share stories where actually the format of the tool is engaging because people become, they like to film themselves and when they feel like they didn't do a good job, they'll be like, oh, I don't want to upload that and they'll redo it again. Yeah. So the, the tool actually does engage the learner in that aspect and we can track their time, right? That, that's a good point, Emily, because I mean, if a learner uploads a piece of footage and they review it and they go, oh, that was horrendous, then they're going to go away and do it again and again and again until they get it right. So it's kind of like, you know, it reinforces the, the, the learning for sure. Because until they submit it, the assessor journey person doesn't get to look at it. So therefore, they got the control over what they're submitting. 
the other side of the coin is that we've had lots of instances where people turn into mini Steven Spielbergs and they upload like, you know, war and peace sometimes. And, you know, and, and, and that happens, but there's a holistic capability in the tool to allow the assessor stroke journey person to holistically mark and see the relevant bits. But the way I view it is encourage them. You're only going to mark what they've covered. I mean, it doesn't matter if they've gone overboard with stuff. I mean, to me, that's consistency and sufficiency. Allow them to show off their capability. You know, it's, it's absolutely fine. I mean, I mean, Daniel, you said something absolutely right. This is their showcase portfolio. It's their e-resume. It's their, it's their future workbook to show somebody what they're capable of doing in a completely open and transparent way and, you know, and, and demonstrating the safety and risk in communication, which is almost not impossible to measure in the current. I love your, your pencil whipping reference, by the way. So yeah, I shall steal that one if you don't mind. <laughs> Yeah, Robert, and we did have some questions about the assessor and, and the neat thing about the tool is it we can work with the partner. So some partners want it to be the journey person mentor and they want the training overseer to be involved or the training director to also see. And as long as you get the appropriate permissions from the learner, it's really up to the partner who gets to see the apprentice's content. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean I, I, I've got to start learning the phrase the authorised person rather than trying to label them right. in a pigeonhole. I mean, it's whoever is responsible for countersigning the work that's been submitted. I mean, in some rare cases, there isn't someone that can do that, but it still allows the apprentice to upload the work. And it goes back to my original point. Because it's so powerful on self-reflection, they don't normally upload instances of them blowing up when they're welding and stuff of that nature. So, you know, it does cover those things. And and, and in some respects, it's, um, it, what we found globally is it allows the learner to feel they can progress into further learning because it's a less painful process. So it kind of moves into the continued personal professional process much easier. Um, you can then, as I mentioned before, some countries tag on you know, advanced apprenticeships, but even artisifer apprenticeships they're called in some other countries to continuously turn them into experts or mastery technicians. Um, and that lifelong learning and engagement into that, I think is, is, is you know, something that could be very powerful in this process too. Yeah, and as the technology related to apprentice learning changes, um, validate can adapt to that, right? So if you were in a virtual reality environment, there, there would be a way to get that learning captured in the validate tool, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly how Rolls-Royce Aeronautical use it. So they capture the VR, AR, because it's video okay. through a headset. They, um, it gets fed into the Validate tool. They can then sit down later with it with their instructor or assessor and review it and tag off those components where they've met something. And in the case of Rolls-Royce Aeronautical, the student can be, you know, in Indonesia and the assessor can be in Darby in England, which is where their head office for apprenticeships are. So again, it overcomes the geographical constraints. Um, and it also becomes the language constraints because you don't have to type nothing. You're just explaining what you do. So that's a big, big, important key consideration too. Yeah. And then I had a question about um, completion and maybe Dan and Bev could speak to this, that some apprentices, you know, they get to the end, they've done the four years or the three years or whatever it is. And then they just don't want to take that multiple choice test. They're so like the test, the format is such a barrier for them that they don't want to go on and how maybe could this tool kind of help that process? I, I think there's a tremendous opportunity here, actually. I think in, in two places. One, the apprentice has spent their apprenticeship videotaping their skill set. And, and as Robert says, perhaps they're doing this more than one time because they want that perfect shot to be uploaded for their validator to look at. I think that in the process of doing that, of recording that once, twice, 20 times, whatever it may be, is going to make them more confident when they go in to sit down and, and do an examination. I think the answers are going to be a little more forthcoming because they've had that opportunity to practice that skill set over and over and over for the purpose of being assessed already. So um, I think that's one aspect that this would be very helpful. In terms of, you know, a hopes and dreams scenario, using a tool like Validate, um, you know, if we talk about potential changes in the future to assessment, that final exam, you know, the weight on that is 100%. 
this is your red seal or not. And if you are so challenged to take that for whatever reason, maybe we look at using a tool like Validate to say, okay, well, the weight of what you've demonstrated is this percentage and the examination becomes the weight of this percentage. So maybe a, a 30, 70. So the onus all isn't on do or die a hundred questions. It's okay, well, I've demonstrated 30% of my mark already and I've been successful because I've had that feedback. I've had that opportunity to be mentored through a digital app or in person. I've had an opportunity to practice all of these skills and now I'm going to sit down and write an exam just to you know, get the rest of that mark. I think that you could potentially use this as a way to offset that weight of grade overall. I think there's a, a big opportunity there. Yeah, I, I really agree with that, Bev. That's a, actually a really great approach. It, it, the multiple choice shouldn't be the, the entirety of like, hey, you're a journey person now. Actually using that combination, I could, I could see it with my fellow uh, the welders were going through that. Um, you, you know, it would have, they, they would have been journey people because they, they, they needed it. Instead, they were being held up and discouraged. Uh, you know, it gets depressing when you have to write an exam five times. And, and, and the other thing with the validate tool uh, does, I find is that it, it can do two things for the apprentice. Uh, first of all, it, it, it can show more realistically that he is actually, in fact, ready to write that exam. Because if you pencil whip your book, well, you're probably not ready to write the test. And the other thing it does is that that's your library as, as the apprentice. Like, geez, you know, I haven't done that in a while. How about I go to that skill and, and review that? It's like, right, that's how I do it. And so then that way they can actually use their own library of learning to challenge the exam. Uh, so, I mean, like, you know, the more you think about this tool, the more, you know, it, the empowerment's just un in, unbelievable. So, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, no, great, great point. And um, and how do you get, how do you kind of envision Robert being able to use this tool for for newcomers? Maybe there's been a question about would it help newcomers? So um, this tool was used to roll out the Health and Social Care Standards Act in the UK in the early two thousands. Um, so uh, a lot of immigration workers. So what they were doing is that they were giving them access to the tool about four to six months prior to entry so that they could start uploading their skills, their qualifications, their testimonies, anything they felt was relevant to claim what it is that they were capable of doing. Several things happened. First, if they can't upload stuff, then you're not just relying on the fact that they've said they've got a, a qualification and therefore they want to gain entry. They're not doing it currently, so therefore there's a problem. But the final, that the ones that were uploading stuff from their own country or what they were doing in this controlled and encrypted environment, we cut achievement time in the health and social care sector from 15 months for a care worker to seven weeks. That was the average because they rocked up with about 60% on average of stuff that they could do. You only train the gaps because the evidence that they provided is legally defensible because most of it's on video or testimony. It significantly pushed them into the areas of what they needed to learn. And conversely, if it was too much, they wouldn't come because they knew that they didn't have enough to meet. So it really did create that great level playing field. Now, if I come back to something you said, Dan, I think this is an important thing is about legacy protection. It's like what you call your library of skills with an aging workforce. Imagine going in and collecting all this evidence from the older generation. You know, how did Sarah do this well? How did Tom do this? Oh, yeah, yeah, can I video? Yeah, sure, you know, no problem. You get it into the system. Then if a job comes in after they've left, you know how they did the job. You've got the evidence, but it also means you can impart that knowledge and learning to the apprentices, even though they may have gone. So I think, yes, there are far-reaching implications about the transparency and the capability of capturing stuff within the tool. So, so yeah. Great, and, and how, I, I like the idea of the videos, because so, so many talented and highly skilled journey persons, as Dan said, are gonna be leaving the workforce because they're gonna be retiring. So I loved what you said about legacy, so we could capture the fantastic way they do one skill and then other apprentices who are coming into the system could learn from that. How though, Robert, do you see the, the other ways that the assessors could use it? So they're gonna have access to how all their apprentices in their program are doing. They're gonna be able to look at the pictures, text, videos. They can 
video journey persons and share that with the apprentice, but how, how do you kind of expect them to use it? They give comments and feedback and can provide personal help, right? They do, and I think this, uh, this, this brings it into what I call like the, the holistic overview, is that for the last 10 or 15 years, we've had phenomenal blended learning, you know, whether it's VR, whether it's AR, whether it's online, book, classroom. What the world has lacked is blended assessment. It allows the individual to upload what it is that's relevant. Now, that's not just for the learner, that's also for the assessor or the journey person, you know, to say, do you know what, I'm gonna go, I've got two apprentices with me today. I'm gonna do some team building, some problem solving, some working with others, some communication, and the pair of them are gonna work together. So it allows the assessor, the journey person, to, to be creative in themselves, how they're gonna capture the evidence as well. And what that does is it ends up creating a standardized approach that's specific to your particular industry while still meeting the occupational standards which are standardized and that's where that auto reference comes into it so again if i use the ministry of defense um, or in the us that that they would put in a task so they would describe the task you need to do this 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 and this get this iso get this manual use these tools do that so it's a descriptor and I would like you to capture this, and it might be two or three little video clips, it might be a testimony, an audio file, or whatever. And they would put that against that one task, and if the assessor and journey person reviews it and they go, yeah, this is pretty good, if the auto-reference has now been linked to 60 or 70 lines of criteria as a result of that task, it can cross-reference automatically on the assessor say so. And I think that kind of tool um, is, is obviously very beneficial, but it also is very useful for things like digital badges and micro-credentials that can be linked as a separate entity tied into it. And I think giving people even part credential recognition on their journey is another thing to engage them. So whether they go, you know, I've done year, year one, the bit, I'm at 37%, that actually equates to this micro-credential or this digital badge on the way to the full apprenticeship, encourages people to stay. And it's about that retention and achievement that's important, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Bev and Dan, do you have any thoughts from an industry perspective? Some questions have been raised um, about this whole idea of uh, a digital badges in learning. Um, Robert just shared his views about how maybe they could support the learner to achieve smaller successes. Do you have any thoughts from, about that from an industry perspective? Uh, yeah, I, I think there would be, uh, some merit to that. Um, uh, carpenters love stickers. <laughs> so, you know, if, if you have, um, if we had common emblems or badges that apprentices could wear with pride to say, I've completed this level and it's, you know, a sticker on a hard hat, you know, my, um, my goal is to collect all of those stickers and adorn my hat so that people see exactly where I am. And, um, yeah, I, for sure, for sure, there is definitely merit in there. I think it is a motivator. Um, I think it is a also for other people who may not be as engaged. Hey, what's that? Where, where'd you get that? How do I get one? What do I have to do? For sure. And the beauty is, is you're getting it as a byproduct of just doing your apprenticeship. Exactly. It's just a. <clears throat> I think. I think. I think also uh, what it does. So in health and safety, a lot of the times when you take an orientation, you wear that stick it so, so that people know that you've taken it. So, you know, as a, as a journey, as a, as a foreman who I just got this individual, just by looking at his hard hat, I'm like, oh, okay, you got that, that, and that sticker. Well, this is the task. I, I, I know you can do that task and go over there without having to go in and whatever. It just helps that communication aspect so much quicker. Uh, right. So uh, 100%, uh, it, it gives motivation as Bev said to, to the apprentice, wear them as badge of honor. Like, Hey, I'm like, it's like a, being a black belt. You know what I mean? You're, you know, going through that. And then, and then also for the, for, you know, the person overseeing that apprentice, they should have a fairly good understanding of where they're at and, and what they can assign them to so that they don't set them up for failure because putting them in a position where they can't do that task and, uh, apprentices are still, you know, uh, they, they have a hard time asking and they don't want to sometimes say they can't do something or whatever. And so when you put them in a position where they, they just don't have the skills for that task yet, they're going to feel, you know, demolished. Uh, you know, they're going to feel like, Jesus, I'm no good. I'm not, I'm not a good, because they, you know, they're all very passionate people. Trades guys are very passionate. Uh, so I think, I think it helps, it helps that uh, from both ends. So. 
And I just I just want to make one comment on the digital badges. I think there's a great opportunity here. I think there's I think they would be great in the industry. Um, I do want to play a little bit of devil's advocate though, and uh, make sure that they don't become the sort of a stopping point uh, mm -hmm. for certain certain sort of employers if they feel that way. If you have somebody who's a really good doorknob installer and you want to progress into a carpenter, you want to still promote the certification piece, right? You don't want to have somebody who's going to be a doorknob installer the rest of their life just because they're good at that piece. Um, that ties back into Dan, what you said earlier about the, 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 the labor market here over the next five to 10 years and all of the exits that we're going to have from retirements and whatnot for, for tradespeople. Um, we want to make sure that we still have fully trained tradespeople. But I, that being said, I do agree with digital badges. I think it's, there's an opportunity to, to prove um, competency in, in certain pieces of the trade as you're moving towards that sort of final certification. And what, what does the group think about digital literacy of apprentices and how that might be a barrier? The research that I've done has shown apprentices are keen to, to use digital tools, keen to get more digital training. They realize it's going to be important. Um, they want to be lifelong learners. They want to be skilled trades professionals. But what, does, what, does, what do you guys think about that? Is digital literacy going to be a barrier for some apprentices and how can we overcome that? So I, I don't know if digital literacy is the barrier for the apprentices, um, the newer, the younger apprentices. I think there is a digital literacy barrier perhaps for the older generation who aren't as involved in the technology. Um, I think there is a strong need from K to nine and beyond that we have information management skills being taught. So the, um, the etiquette that surrounds cell phone usage on the job and off the job at break time, when is it appropriate, when is it not appropriate? I think there needs to be some discussion with this tool with our employers as well. I think there may be some pushback on the idea of whipping out a cell phone to do recordings on a job site. I think it has to be a very transparent conversation and an understanding of what's being recorded and it, when it, appropriate some of our job sites you know are, are high level security and that just would not be an option um, but there may be ways to get around that so again that discourse is really important um, in terms of what some older generations might feel about well I don't want cell phones on my job site I don't you know I think we have to recognize that we are in a digital age um, the technology is already being used. So we have our contractors are using digital blueprint programs like Procore and PlanGrid and Bluebeam. You know, they're taking photos of situations and they're sending it off to the architect and engineers who are hundreds of miles away to analyze something that's happening on the site. Um, they're already using iPads and tablets and cell phones to, you know, track things like um, inventory for inspection purposes, they're using safety apps. Um, the technology is there, I think it's just um, incorporating, again, that information and management skill training in everything that they do and understanding what some of those protocols and uh, you know, what's appropriate and when. Do you agree with that, Dan? Yeah, I do. Um, actually, everything Beth said was uh, like spot on. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think what the tool, uh, or at least with the, with, the, with the research that you guys are doing now and being able to bring the data and help convince them to say like, listen, you get a better employee by taking the time and doing these little things. That's, well, that's where you'll get the, the buy-in. And then like Beth said, they're already taking videos and pictures and stuff anyways. You know, why not help the apprentice out and, and track it uh, that way? So uh, yeah, 100%. Great, yeah. So someone has raised a, a, a comment about the uh, North. And Robert, would you have any any um, experience? I know you've used Validate all over the world in areas where there isn't good access to internet, like maybe some of our Northern communities, can they use Validate or is this really another barrier? No, I, I think you can separate it up into separate elements. So as long as they've got the means to capture the evidence where they're at, they don't have to upload it there and then. They can upload it a week, a month, six weeks, eight weeks later, or even when they go to the training establishment and, and have a few days 
doing their e-resumes and uploading and reviewing. So as long as they've got the ability to capture the evidence in their workplace, you don't necessarily need the internet at all. I mean, it can be a digital camera, it can be an old cell phone, it doesn't need to be connected. <clears throat> That's one particular model. and We've had some experience of that um, in the early turn, turn of the century. Gosh, that makes me sound old now. Um, in Scotland, of all places, because of obviously the highlands with the internet connectivity. Um, now, the other way, and these are some other ways, you know, they're not necessarily the main ways, but there are other ways as well, is that if the individual doesn't have the means to capture the evidence, they experimented with a very successful group of peripatetic assessors. So you had a team of professionally qualified assessors whose role was nothing other than to go out and watch people capture the evidence on their behalf and then go back and make those judgments. I mean, that's another tool that you could potentially use, not necessarily you know, wonderfully, you know, fiscally, you know, pragmatic, but nonetheless, it's an option, nonetheless. Um, and I think that once you understand what it is that the particular challenges are, um, and within five or 10 years, they probably won't exist with the propagation of the way the internet is changing the world through distance learning, because the way the pandemic has changed the way of access for people and so on and so forth, you know, we will find ways to overcome those, whether they're an offline version, we have an offline version, a PW app version as well. Um, but of course that negates the direct communication, which sometimes that they can, you know, fall foul of. But there are ways and means to mitigate that, uh, that group of individuals that sometimes will be challenged by the lack of access to technology. Yeah, great, great. And I know that there's a always been attempts made to get more um, internet access to our northern community. So that's important as well. Um, so somebody's asked a specific question um, about the uh, CA Future Skills Center project. So I just wanted to share a little more about what we're doing as a part of our pilot. Um, so uh, we have uh, electrical uh, carpentry, welding, and plumbing. We've taken the Canadian Red Seal standards and we've put them into um, the validate tool. Um, Robert's in the process now of creating some guidance for the apprentices and journey person. So, you know, little text pieces, I think, Robert, little videos, and, and maybe you're going to host some webinars to have some guidance because it will be a new thing for some people. So, we want to try to help support them. And we are recruiting right now. Um, We've got a push right now between now and the end of January, and we're going to recruit carpentry and electrical apprentices first. Um, and then we'll be reaching out trying to get welder and plumber apprentices. We're aiming for 2000 and we're going to give them free licenses between now and the uh, June 2022 when the project ends. And we really just want to give them an opportunity to try out this tool that Robert's given you a few highlights of today. Um, see what they think. Um, as a part of our research process, we are doing pre and post uh, questionnaires with the apprentices to kind of think what were they thinking out about it at the beginning of the process, and then what was their actual experience like. So we'll be able to compare that information. And then we're also doing interviews with journey persons and employers and apprentices to gather further feedback about what they think about this validate tool and whether it would have ongoing um, use in the Canadian uh, context. So we hope by March uh, 2022 that we'll have a report with some pilot findings. We're going to share it back out with the apprenticeship community and have, a, an, have an event hopefully in person um, so that we can share the findings with you and engage industry in further dialogue about assessment and on the job training. So that's just a bit of an overview of um, our tool. I did have a question for you. Uh, Go ahead. Um, so uh, you mentioned, so you're going to start off with free licenses for people. Um, eventually, it'll become a pay service. Um, is there any indication that perhaps the government might step in and help relieve that financial burden on the apprentice for paying into it? Uh, or even employers, just because of the added benefit that it does give uh, the government in, in attracting work to be done here in Canada? Yeah, well, some Canadian employers are like, I would like to use this tool on an ongoing basis with my apprentices, and I actually would like to pay for them to have the licenses. Um, so we're hoping in the future that this is something that employers will see the value in, 
and that they'll want to, to help um, pay for their apprentices to have access to the tool. Absolutely. Great, so I think we covered um, all the questions that we had. Um, that's, does anyone have any final comments or thoughts, things that you feel we didn't cover that you'd like to share at this point? Um, there was one question um, from Jonathan about blockchain, um, which yeah, I think yeah. we go ahead. Around. So in relation to blockchain, um, I can only repeat what somebody said to me a couple of months ago. It says that if the portfolio, i.e. the, the e-resume, for want of a better word, is full of non -trans uh, sorry, full of transparent and proven evidence, why do you need blockchain? Because it's not about the credentials, it's about the applied capability of the individual. If the credential is five or ten years old, you know, you have sometimes a sufficiency, you know, problem that they've not been employed in that job. And I thought that was a very interesting question. And um, and then there was a seminar very shortly after that that perhaps because of the pandemic and the transparency that the world has now moved into, we've almost potentially jumped over the need for blockchain because it's not about the credential anymore. It's about the applied capability of an individual and what they can do. Very interesting thought process. I think it was a very interesting discussion. Um, and that's what happens sometimes, I think, you know, humanity moves quickly and it, it, it evolves and it innovates. And um, so, yeah, I just thought I'd mention that question, answer to that question, sorry. Great. And yeah, somebody was just asking for further clarification. Like we did talk a bit about newcomer skills, uh, Robert, but like they could, um, a, a newcomer could take um, evidence that they gather. If they had the ePortfolio tool, they could upload that evidence and it could be assessed by an employer. Like it can yeah. basically be a live resume for the newcomer, right? If they would like yeah. it to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it could help prior learning recognition processes for newcomers and for credential recognition? Yeah, absolutely. As I said, you know, internationally, we've got a lot of experience of that. I'll give you one example in the US last month um, in cosmetology, I think barbarism, hairdressing. Um, this institute was using Validate for newcomers. Um, they were collecting their evidence, they came in. Um, the very first day they sat the state exam, um, several people failed the state exam. They challenged it because of the evidence in Validate and they overturned it because they had demonstrable capability. So of course, then they're able to be employed, they can earn for the family, they don't have to spend another three, six, nine months doing training. That's the kind of world we're moving into. It's about, look, you know, come on, please. You know, I can show what I can do. I have the skills. It's exactly what Dan and Bev, you were talking about. It's about, you know, the applied, you know, process. And in the COVID recovery, that's really critical to get the economies back up and running really critical. Yeah, someone has asked, is it AODA compliant? Validate? Well, if it's that's, that, that's Disability Discrimination Act, isn't it? It's the same. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to learn all the acronyms as I travel around the world, yeah. Um, so, um, yes, it is. I mean, I think we have to be careful that, generally speaking, within a trade profession, um, a lot of the disability discrimination requirements have normally been sort of like taken in the context of the job. You wouldn't have an electrician that's colorblind. I mean, you should certainly hope not. Anyway, um, so, you know, while the technology has the basics of the disability discrimination compliance, they are moving all the time in relation to that. But most browsers have within the browser setup the capability to do everything they need anyway so you can go in it can read the text you can magnify you can zoom in you can zoom out it does all of those things particularly well but um so yes it is compliant um and it's a it's a constant you know process that we undertake you know um regularly uh, great. And just one final thing. People are asking, oh, could I get to see this tool? And what our approach we're taking in the project is we're, we're happy to give you a demo, but obviously due to intellectual copyright reasons, we, we can't just provide access to the tool um, to everybody, but happy to give you a demo if you would like to um, have, discuss it in more detail with Robert and to see how you might be able to use it in your um, specific context. So happy to do that and have been doing demos for employers all across the country since the summer and having a lot of uh, positive feedback and positive discussion. 
So great. Well, if there's nothing else, if there's no other comments, I'd just like to pass it off to Michael to do the closing. Sure. Thanks, Emily. And, and uh, yeah, so special thank you to everybody for participating today. Um, all of the panelists, uh, as well as all the participants uh, that joined us here today. There is a, you know, a lot happening in the world right now. Um, when we look at, uh, at apprenticeship and, and you know, in, in the face of sort of the pandemic that hit us earlier this year, or even, I guess, November was the, uh, was the anniversary of the first case in China, um, apprenticeship has had to adapt quickly over the last few months. Uh, we've seen that in all jurisdictions where we've moved from a tradition of in-classroom technical training to pretty much everybody's doing at least some form of blended learning online. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, as directors from across the country and, and senior leaders within the apprenticeship groups, we're eagerly awaiting the, uh, <clears throat> the results of this pilot project and the research that comes out of this. Um, answer a little bit to your question there, Dan, would government step in? I think, you know, we're, we're like I said, we're, we want to see the results and see what's going to happen with this and figure out, you know, the next steps in, in showing the, the proof of all this through the pilot is for us to go back and look at our individual assessment uh, methodologies and the way that we do it and figure out how we would incorporate something like a validate tool into uh, into those assessment methodologies so um so yeah so with that i'll uh, i'll uh, wish everybody a good day and and i don't know if there's any other final thoughts emily or, or pedro if, if, if there's anything else from the future skills center I, I think we're good there so again thanks everybody for participating we'll invite everybody to visit the community of practice if you have any other questions or any other uh comments that you'd like to make we'll, we'll continue the ongoing discussion around this topic uh, and i wish everybody a safe and, uh, and happy week thank you very much